Hello, and thank you for tuning in to another Aquatic Invasive Species Spotlight. Water chestnut is probably one of the most recognizable aquatic invasive species in the Hudson Valley due to its large, inconspicuous floating rosettes that crowd in coves and the sharp seeds that line the shoreline along the Hudson River. Despite this, it's not actually as common in inland water bodies and is still classified as a tier three or established plant in the lower Hudson Prism region. Young local infestations of this plant still have potential for eradication. So water chestnut is native to Europe, Asia, and Africa, and is yet another one of our earliest invaders. This plant was first reported in New York in 1884. Water chestnut was introduced as an ornamental pond plant, but because it can quickly take over an entire pond, the plant was likely able to spread into natural areas through discard of unwanted plants, as well as by its sharp barbed seeds hitchhiking on waterfowl. Water chestnut still has a relatively small distribution and is only found in the northeastern United States. Water chestnut can tolerate both freshwater and estuarine environments, but it does best in slow moving lakes, ponds, rivers, or streams that are less than 15 feet deep. It thrives in nutrient rich eutrophic or highly productive lakes with muddy substrates and can grow, grow into dense mats with its rosettes stacking on top of one another up to a foot deep. This infestation here shown in this picture is actually only one or two years old. So the rate of reproduction for this plant contributes greatly to its exponential growth, which we'll discuss in the next slide. So the primary form of reproduction for water chestnut is through its prolific production of seeds. Each seed can grow into 10 or 12 stems, hosting up to 20 rosettes. And in turn, each rosette can then produce up to 20 seeds, which drop off in August. These seeds can begin germinating during the next growth cycle, or they can lay dormant for up to 12 years in the sediment. The seeds are then able to disperse through currents or waterfowl, and entire rosettes are regularly seen attached to boat motors and trailers. The timing of the release of seeds is crucial for managing this plant because this is most, the most likely means for a growth of an infestation Removing the rosettes before they drop seeds is paramount to achieving eradication. One of the most obvious impacts of this plant is the blockage of sunlight and prevention of photosynthesis in native aquatic plants. Additionally, water chestnut contributes heavily to low dissolved oxygen in multiple ways. While the plant produces oxygen through photosynthesis, that oxygen is released into the atmosphere as opposed into the water column. Then, especially in large infestations with excess plant material, when the plant dies off, oxygen is consumed during decomposition. Also during dieback, the nutrient held in the leaves of the plant are released, contributing to algal blooms, which further depletes oxygen So water chestnut has buoyant cord-like stems up to 16 feet long and it has these feathery roots. The leaves are triangular and heavily deeply serrate, uh, the more jagged edged. These leaves are arranged in a floating rosette and the leaves are attached to air-filled petioles and that's what contributes to its buoyancy. It also has a small white flower, which you won't necessarily need to be able to identify this plant. And it has four horned, sharp, barbed nutlets. And these can be either green or black. When they're green, that means that they are living and still viable. But the black seeds you'll often find floating in the water or along the shoreline are not viable. Either way, the seeds are very sharp and can pierce skin. So for the longest time, we did not have a lookalike really for water chestnut, but recently a new species of trappa has been discovered in Virginia, trappa bispinosa. Now it was likely this plant was uh, marked as water chestnut trapanatum, um, just because of how similar they look when floating on the surface. However, when you turn the plant over, that's when you can really see its distinguishing 
features. So Trapanatum is green under, on the underside and also has those four horned uh, nutlets. While Trapa by Spinoza is actually pink or reddish on the underside and only has two horned nutlets. Additionally, Trapa by Spinoza has a pink flower as opposed to a white flower. That's going to be it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you so much for watching and be sure and stay tuned for more Species Spotlight videos.